In the cinematic sea of prequels, sequels, reboots, and reimaginings, the Movie Retakes podcast considers the merits and desires for Hollywood's new takes on our beloved movie classics. Brothers Matt and Chris Sully examine the latest retake franchises, pitch their own original retake visions, and share their love for the movies that made them. This is the big hatman, Sully. And good journey, everyone. This is Matt at Arms, Matt Sully. Everything comes to he who waits. And I have waited so very long for this moment. Welcome to Season 2 of Movie Retakes. It's so awesome to be back. It's a new Fine. year, a new season. We've got a great lineup of, of stuff we're going to be reviewing and talking about. And uh, some of you have probably already been to a few of the lives. We're going to be doing a lot more of those coming up. Um, so you can find us all over the place now. Um, and uh, please join us for all the lives and the watch-alongs that we're going to be doing. We've got one coming up uh, March 6th. We're going to be doing a watch-along with Coming to America, the sequel to Coming to America. <laughs> so uh, don't be confused about which one. Either way, we get some good entertainment. It'll be a lot of fun. And we're doing all that on Twitch. Uh, so be sure to follow our Twitch channel now so you don't miss out on those notifications when we go live. That's twitch.tv slash movie retakes. And if you don't know anything about Twitch, there's nothing to know. You just go to that link and you watch along and you can interact with us. Uh, they don't advertise Twitch, but they should as a place for interaction. Uh, you can come and watch and interact. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's not all about gaming and 12-year-old kids, I promise. <laughs> That's true, and but you can still find us over on uh, uh, Twitter and YouTube as well, so you can follow us there. Uh, and on Instagram now, we've got a resurgence in our is Instagram activity, thanks to my wife, Vanessa. Um, so appreciating a shout-out to her for good uh, work over there. Um, so yeah, we're all over the place and um, having a good time everywhere. Uh, but first, before we get into the wonderful world of Masters of the Universe, what are you watching? Well, let's see. I have been trying to dial back a little bit because I was uh, getting too deep down the rabbit hole and running out of content. But I did, uh, I did manage to finally go back and watch the Andre the Giant documentary on HBO. I'm Great. not even a big wrestling guy, but I found that very interesting. I, mm -hmm. I've always wondered about him. Uh, they did a great job with it, and what an interesting fella. Go watch it if you haven't seen it yet. You don't need to be a wrestling fan to enjoy it. Uh, it's so funny. I never considered what his accent was until then. Yeah. Like, I just thought he talked funny, but it turns out he was French. <laughs> I mean, we were, I'm we an were idiot. little kids when he was popular, and you don't think about that in the same way. It's just like, yeah. oh, yeah, he has a bit of an accent. Yeah. I never thought French either. That was not where I would have gone, uh, mm -hmm. even if he had asked me before watching the documentary. I watched Greenland. We talked about this on the uh, on the live we did the other day, including a, a, a review of it. So you'll be able to watch that on YouTube if you want to check that out, the recording of our live. Uh, Warrior, great series on HBO Max. Uh, so much fun. Based on the writings of Bruce Lee. Uh, it's set in the late 1800s, San Francisco. Uh, the uh, Them bringing over Chinese uh, immigrants to work in the in the mines uh, who essentially were were serving as slaves mm -hmm. uh but there was a contingency in, in chinatown there of these different groups uh and uh, they each had their own guys who would go to battle and so that's where these warriors come in really good full of people you've never seen before great actors and actresses i love it two seasons uh the last one was last year so i'm hoping we get more this year in season three where where is that available that's on hbo max here in the states oh, okay. it is wonderful i really i couldn't stop watching it it's so good mm. so good and it reminds me of another series i wouldn't be surprised if there was an overlap in the uh the creators the writers and there was one actor who overlapped uh the series banshee that was on cinemax uh fantastic if you haven't watched that but very nsfw just just fyi mm. <laughs> uh letter kenny season nine i finally got into it it is not as good as the previous seasons but it's good to revisit our old pals uh pitter patter if you haven't watched it already get at her and I finally, I got so low on the, uh, the content uh, <laughs> that I decided to start watching Young Sheldon. I, I, I kind of looked down my nose at this <laughs> one for a long time. I've got into it now, and I love it. It is really well done. Interesting tidbit here. 
even if you haven't watched the show, you've seen the trailers for it. The mom on the show, who plays a younger mom from Big Bang Theory, Laurie Metcalf played her on Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The actress who plays her on Young Sheldon is actually Laurie Metcalf's daughter. Oh, that's clever. In real life. And so I was boggled when I read about that. I'm like, it's perfect. Her, she sounds just like her. And I thought, well, that's just great acting. Turns out she probably just talking the way she talks. <laughs> yeah. Just her normal accent. Just sounds right. just like her mom. Laurie Metcalf is one of those uh, comedians that I just didn't really pay attention to until uh, we were rewatching the Roseanne series recently, and uh, man, she's she's funny. Like she, she is. Uh, I, I didn't realize how much of that show's comedy was was due to her. Like she's just so she hits it when she hits it. And she's yeah. over the top, and it's brilliant. Her timing, and, flawless. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she's good. Her daughter has that too. She does a great job. Actually, her daughter seems a bit more uh, like she could do drama, but she's nailing the comedy too. She does mm. a great job. Her name's Zoe Perry, I think. Uh, podcasts I haven't been listening to much because that used to be what I listened to when I ran. I'm about a month away from being able to get out and run again here in mm. uh, in Washington, uh, but I can't wait to get back to Mark Marin, WTF, one of my favorites, ID10T. Uh, oh, and when I was driving back from Texas, because we haven't had a podcast in a while. Uh, when I was driving back from Texas at Christmas, I listened to a whole lot of uh, Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Michael Rosenbaum played Lex Luthor on the Smallville series. He's oh. an excellent podcaster. He comes across at first a little condescending and a little full of himself. It's just, it's that's not him. He's actually a very sincere, super nice guy the more I listen. And I love his interview style. And because he's an actor, and he's been in so many things over the last few years, at least 10 years. Uh, he knows all these people in the industry. So he's had a few people from Smallville on, but he also has recently had on some other big names that I really enjoyed, including Nathan Fillion. I uh, yeah. love that one. And Matthew McConaughey, that was a great one. Uh, so I highly recommend Inside of You podcast with Michael Rosenbaum. Games, still playing Fall Guys and Rocket League. I call myself on Twitch a not-so-variety streamer now because I play those so often. Uh, but I love them. They've always got a new event, a new something coming. And just announced this week uh, during Nintendo's Direct thing, their big live reveal that they do every year, uh, Fall Guys will be coming to the Switch and Xbox this summer. It was not on either of those platforms, and everybody was asking for it. Uh, so you have that to look forward to. It it has such a Nintendo look that I didn't even realize that it wasn't already on the Switch. I thought that's what right. you've been playing it on the whole time. It Yeah, you're I, right. It just seems to fit. I didn't get that. Yeah. No, it's uh, right now it's been a PlayStation only uh, mm -hmm. as well as Steam. I guess PlayStation got a uh, got the rights to it, an exclusive rights deal. Uh, but that uh, must end soon because we're getting them uh, on both platforms this summer. And what all of us fans are hoping is there's cross-platform play because so far there has not been. So we have oh. friends that had it on PC who basically went and bought a PlayStation just so they could play Fall Guys with us. And then couldn't. Or, no, they oh, can't. they had to because they of, had to, oh, so they I could see. play. So they went and bought a several hundred dollar console oh, so they my. could play this game that looks like it was designed for mobile devices. But the game is so much fun, as well as so very irritating. Yeah, <laughs> not just watching you play is a lot of fun. Like even right? being as an audience to the game, and that's that's uh, there's not a lot of games like that where. Uh -uh. People can just kind of sit around and watch you play and actually still have a good time and join you fall down or, you know, go over the little hurdles and stuff. And all the characters are really funny looking. It's nice. And and whoever, the, it, Mediatonic, I think, is the company that made it. Uh, along There's another company involved, too. Whatever they did, they've done it right. They have these seasons. They're constantly putting out the new skins. Their social media is on point. Like, everything about the game is fun. I love their social media channels. And they have a link with Amazon now where if you link your Amazon account, you can go in and, like, once every, I don't know, quarter? No, it's once a month. Free skins and free crowns just by linking your Amazon account and going in and claiming those. Hmm. So very, very smart. Uh, That's cool. Yeah, they, they're doing everything right, and I just hope they continue that way. And then I, I recently tried a game called Destruction All-Stars. Uh, it's free on PlayStation this month. That's February. Uh, it's pretty fun. It looked like Twisted Metal meets Rocket League, and I mm. was very intrigued by that. It delivers on a lot of fronts, but doesn't across the board. It's missing mm. some elements, and I can't put my finger on what that is, uh, but I... I played it a few times on streams i don't know if i'll be going back to it but it, it, was, a, it was a beautifully made game i love the graphics on it uh maybe they'll do some updates and and get me back we'll see 
couple stars for that one. We have, we uh, need our own game rating system as well. Kind of. Yeah. I, somewhere <laughs> yeah. between two and three. If they could get that up to three and a half, four, I'd return. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see I, rem- do with I that. remember Twisted Metal, man, when that came out. That was so much fun. Everybody was playing that, like everywhere Dude, you went. That if was... Twisted Metal came out with a new game now with online play, it would dominate Twitch. Everybody be playing that. With That's like customization true. to your cars? Come oh, on. Yeah. That'd be sick, man. That would be. Yeah, that's true. Uh, well, we've talked um, on, when we've been doing the lives. Uh, we've talked a lot about what we've been watching um, in this interim between our podcast episodes. So I'm not going to go too far into there, but I, a couple of highlights, um, things that uh, we've watched that I've enjoyed. Uh, we we got into Superstore after I know you've been recommending it for a long time. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, we're going to keep Keep watching that all the way through. It's really nice to see Mark McKinney again. I don't know if everybody uh, knows this, uh, but yeah, he's back from Kids in the Hall. I don't know why he chose that, speaking that high voice the whole time, but... (laughs) You know he regrets it now. (laughs) Yeah, because that was a choice he has to continue with the whole time. But his character's great. Uh, All the characters on there are really good. And uh, yeah, I think it's a sort of easily accessible show for a mass audience. Gets a little bit... um, uh, racy at times or whatever in some of their subject matter, but I, I think it ultimately is uh, is um, pretty good entertainment for a lot of different types of people. Side note on that one, you know, Lauren Ash, who plays uh, Dina on the show, the, like the head security mm-hmm. uh, lady, super funny. She has her own podcast as well. If you get oh, a chance, right. you must check it out. And her presence on social media is really good. Her and Ben Feldman, not the real Ben Feldman, but the Ben Feldman on Superstore, <laughs> shout out. Uh, yeah. They do some of the episodes together. Uh, and they have what seems to be a really good friendship going. Uh, I love that. I love that that when you have a show that you can get invested in the characters, and then behind the mm-hmm. scenes you can get invested in the actors, that really adds a level to it. Oh, it's great. It's great for them. It's great for the show and anything they do after that, yeah. Um, yeah, she's awesome on there. Uh, I, that that segues over for me. You were mentioning the uh, the podcast with um, Lex Luthor there. I can't remember his real name, sorry. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Michael Rosenbaum. Michael Rosenbaum, okay. Um, uh, I had actually sought out, um, I we, we were watching, what was it, like Dodgeball or something a few months back, and I was realizing I haven't seen Justin Long in forever. Oh, yeah. And this kid was on the rise, like he was in a couple of things, big stuff, and I'm like, this kid's really funny, and he does all the physical comedy, and I, and I was like, hey, we should be seeing tons more of him, and they just kind of vanished. So I was looking for him. He has a podcast now, uh, and I think it's called Life is Short with Justin Long, a little play on words there. Um, But he does interviews with um, his celebrity friends, just people he's met um, randomly, and it's very casual. It's very um, lighthearted and stuff, but it's a really good podcast. Uh, his brother's on there sometimes, so obviously I support that sort of thing. And um, it's uh, it's just a it's just a nice, easy to listen to thing. And there's really good guests and stuff. Um, so you guys sh- should check that. Really out. Really interesting because that movie that Kevin Smith made that I despise so much, Tusk. The hmm. main premise behind that is that Justin Long is a podcaster with uh, <laughs> Haley Joel Osment. and then he goes on this uh, investigative uh, reporting podcast right. thing with a guy. Anyway, uh, but yeah, he plays a podcaster, and then that I guess that podcast probably short started not too long after that. Maybe he got the bug. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know how long it's been been around, but it's it's really good. You guys should check it out. Uh, but what are we going to experience in this episode of the Masters of the Universe podcast? <laughs> longer stand between me and my destiny but i will i told you it was always between us oh my ache to smash you out of existence to drive your cursed face from my memory forever yes let this be our final battle well i tell you what uh, we've got a few questions that we'll need to answer along the road today. Uh, one, how do you spell low budget movie? Two, when is being a pig boy a reward? And three, how much is a cosmic key? 
All mm. those answers wait for you. Uh, if you just keep listening, don't hit play or fast forward or rewind or anything. <laughs> All right. And that segues us over into our first behind the scenes segment of the new year and the new season entitled Alphabet Soup. Straight to video, direct to cable, movie of the week, B movie. Though these terms have faded with changing times, the implications of their quality has always been the same. I still often use the term B movie without considering its origins or the possibility there are other letter designations for subpar filmmaking. There are. Firstly, this has nothing to do with the MPA rating system nor the animated Seinfeld failure. A B movie is a low budget commercial production, not an independent film aimed at select audience. Originally, the term identified films intended for distribution as the less publicized bottom half of a double feature akin to the B-sides of recorded music. After the 1950s, with the emergence of commercial television, B-movie production departments converted to TV movie production divisions, producing the same content for different medium. B-movies, often referred to all manner of genre, notably western, sci-fi, and horror, where audiences were more welcoming to blood, makeup effects, and action over high drama and dialogue. While B-movies transitioned away from theaters and into television, they made a huge resurgence in the emerging home video rental and cable markets. And it's in cable television we find the next tier down from B-movie, the C-movie. Low-quality filler programming, the C and C-movie reference not only the quality below B, but its established home in cable. Mystery Science Theater 3000 helped popularize the love of both C programming and B-movies for new audiences by presenting and commenting on low-grade films, primarily sci-fi from the 50s and 60s. Z movies, Z movies from my Canadian friends, characterizes low budget films with quality standards well below most B and C movies. Think Ed Wood's Glenn or Glinda and Plan 9 from Outer Space, often called the worst film ever made. More modern Z movies often focus on violence, gore, and sexual content with a minimum interest in art or message. With the move to streaming services producing original content, we still see a variety of films being made, making it harder to predict a movie's quality based on where it airs. But B-movies will never go away. As bad as they are, we still love them. A's are fine and dandy, but B's and C's are good enough for a diploma, and they're good enough for cinema, too. And in the last few months, C has clearly stood for COVID programming as well. <laughs> I've had no problem with that. I'll take anything these days. It's interesting. I use B-movie, too, and I never knew that origin story. Yeah, I never looked it up. I just always knew what I meant when I said it. Yeah. It's got this stigma of things that came out for TV or came out just for cable, but now things coming out for the streaming services, you really just don't know. Some of them are really good, and uh, a lot of them aren't, but that's okay. But yeah, now we don't have that same sort of, or we can't automatically apply that stigma to stuff that doesn't go to the theater. Yeah, and and it, there's a shift happening. I've been talking about it for years. I think before long, uh, the traditional television programming uh, is going to, it's really hurting already. And I think it's going to start to die off more and more and more. And, and like ABC, NBC, CBS, they all have their own streaming platforms. Now mm -hmm. they're eventually it's all just going to be streaming. Uh, you won't need traditional cable. Uh, most of us won't anyway, uh, anywhere. Uh, I, I think I think it's all going to change. And yeah, they're finding new ways to trick us kind of into just watching <laughs> anything like on Netflix. I won't watch a show unless I watch the trailer and I see somebody speaking to the camera because I can't tell you how many times I've fallen for a foreign film. And, and no offense, I'll, I'll watch a good foreign film with subtitles or dubbing, but I have to be prepared for it. Don't trick me. Let me know up front that I'm about to watch a dubbed film. I have to uh, get in the headspace for that. I know exactly what you're saying. For some reason, we noticed this here in Canada, the commercials advertising TV shows, not not for streaming stuff, but for on their TV networks, their favorite thing to do is to take out all the dialogue. They just put random clips and yep. some song over it. And we're like, what is the show? Why would anybody watch the show? You've given us nothing. <laughs> So I, I don't know what it is. There's probably just one guy. That's his style is because he's lazy yep. and doesn't want to actually put together anything good. But it, that's his M.O. Um, and yeah, and sometimes you can tell. And I picked up on that, too. Trailers for movies that no one speaks. I'm like, oh, OK, well, that's yeah, that's a foreign movie, which I'm all over. It's fine with me. Uh, I find that I'm really getting into a lot more uh, foreign uh films and TV shows lately. I'm watching a ton of stuff out of Korea and China and Japan. 
um, and um, French films and TV as well. I just watched, uh, I don't know if this is even advertised for you guys, but uh, the show called Lupin, L-U-P-I-N. Oh, yeah. yeah, I started um, it. Yeah, really good. Um, uh-huh. Really like entertaining. Yeah, he's he's fantastic. And uh, the show is just kind of, um, I don't know, it's a fun little um, drama. I don't, I don't know what you compare it to, but it's uh, it's kind of a heist show, but it's uh, it's pretty light. Um Anyway, it's it's really good. There was another French show that we watched. Um, um, now I'm going to blank on the name, but it was a it was a horror show that we actually I think we talked about in our um, in our horror special. So go back and listen to that since I can't remember the name. <laughs> what was the uh, the Korean uh, zombie movie hashtag? Uh, alive, I think. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. I just wasn't sure if that was right. I find, I watched that shortly after your recommendation. Loved it. Yeah. I really, really enjoyed that movie, and it was it was uh, it was subtitled, but I really, mm-hmm. really enjoyed it. It was re- well done. Well, I find as I've transitioned to my older age, I I pretty much I put the subtitles on for everything we watch. It helps. Um, so I am used to just reading and rather than listening, and so it's really no transition at all for me to watch these uh, foreign language films. But today we are going to cover. Masters of the Universe, by the power of Grayskull! This is, you know, it's, um, we, we, we did a watch along recently to, uh, so you guys, I, I don't even know, I don't remember how many people had actually seen it, uh, that watched it with us, uh, maybe only a couple. We should have done a but, poll. Yeah, we should have had a poll, but, but you and I had seen it when we were kids yeah, and um, I remember liking it, but that may have been because we were kids yep. um, because we were always He-Man fans. I mean, it was, it was stuff that was designed for young boys. Um, and this franchise is huge. I mean, they've got books, comics, magazines, obviously it all stemmed from the toys themselves. Um, but films, there were uh, He-Man and She-Ra, The Secret of the Sword from 1985, which actually did go to the theater. Um, Masters of the Universe, which we'll mostly talk about today, and we watched in the watch-along of 1987. But there have been several animated series. He-Man and the Masters of the Universe from 83 to 85. She-Ra, Princess of Power from 85 to 86. The New Adventures of He-Man. I remember that. Everything in the 90s is always the new adventures of and just mm-hmm. bring back whatever cartoon used to be popular. Uh, from 90 to 91, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, the name in here, which is great. Uh, 2002 to 2004, She-Ra and the Princess of Power, which is a, a more modern one, and I think it's still going, and our, it my is. daughter watches it too. <laughs> She-Ra and the Princess of Power from 2018 to, I think, present time. Uh, there was even been a television special of He-Man and She-Ra, a Christmas special. They always have to have the Christmas special. Um, but Masters of the Universe... Yeah, sorry, go I ahead. I don't know if you have it in here uh, anywhere, but we've also got the upcoming Kevin Smith Masters of the Universe with an yes. amazing all-star voice cast, and I'm very excited about that. Yeah, we'll talk about that when we when we talk about the uh, upcoming movie as well. Yeah. Um, but the original uh, Masters of the Universe, here's the synopsis for this. Uh, the heroic warrior He-Man battles against the evil Lord Skeletor and his armies of darkness for control of Castle Grayskull. This starred Dolph Lundgren, Frank Langella, Meg Foster, Billy Barty, Courtney Cox, John Cipher, James Tolkien, and Chelsea Phil- Field. Uh, she is who played Tila. And she's also this episode's actor spotlight. Currently, Chelsea's on NCIS New Orleans as Rita Devereaux. And you might remember her from movies like The Dark Half, The Last Boy Scout, Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man, and Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger. So she's one of those people that have been around a little while, and you've seen her. You just may not have known her name or or associated those other things, uh, other movies and shows with her. Uh, This was directed by Gary Goddard. This was his first and last feature <laughs> length production. So, yeah, you, you probably know a lot just from that. Uh, written by David O'Dell, who wrote for The Muppet Show, uh, The Dark Crystal, the new series, Age of Resistance. He also wrote the movie Supergirl, uh, the movie Dark Crystal, and Running Scared. This came out in 1987 amid... Uh, the top hits at the box office, Beverly Hills Cop 2, Fatal Attraction, and Three Men and a Baby. And it was a summer release. I think they were hoping <laughs> to get that summer release money. Uh, it made $17.3 million against a budget of $22 million. 
And that sound continues as you hear the Rotten Tomatoes score 17 percent. That's a teen. <laughs> Not a 70, a 17. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what are your thoughts after watching this again? So we did the watch along and I, w- I was really more focused on making fun of stuff while we were watching. So you, you commented afterwards and, and I agreed, uh, got to go back and watch again. So I forced myself to sit and watch it again reluctantly, but I needed to for the, for the purpose of today's podcast. Um, wow. It, it's like, just I, I know a lot about this movie because it's a great documentary, uh, The Power of Grayskull, you can watch on Netflix about this, w- with the problems that it ran into. Mm. But it's like they said, let's let's make this thing for the kids, this Masters of the Universe movie, but we don't really want to set it on Eternia because that's going to cost too much. Let's just throw it into modern-day America uh, and have the battle take place here because that's going to be a lot cheaper, and it shows. And it certainly doesn't hold up over time. The special effects, although there's some cool moments in there that they managed to do with with uh, uh, realistic effects or whatever you want to call that, non-digital. Um, br- boy, it's brutal. And it's sad because Dolph Lundgren looks the part. He's amazing as He-Man as far as visuals. Courtney Cox, big name. Thought that'd be great. Eh. James Tolkien at the time was pretty hot. All right, no more crapping around. What is this? I don't know. I got vandalism. I got arson. I got stuff blowing up in my face running. That, that's not a guy that draws Slacker. people into the box office. You know, Meg Foster, she's just that chick with the crazy eyes. Like, people are, I want to see her in something, but she's not a box office draw. I mean, a lot of things were there for this movie, and then a whole lot wasn't unfortunately i think the only reason they made the 17 million was because it was called masters of the universe and at the time we had been playing with the action figures and watched the cartoon and that was it that's all they had going for them um yeah i i don't plan on watching this again in my adult life uh i'm i'm far more excited about a possible uh reboot and to see where they go with this i agree one and a half stars and the only reason it gets the extra half star uh is nostalgia yeah Totally. Yeah, one and a half stars for me as well. Um, I thought the fun in watching this was making fun of it, uh, just like you said. Um, the concept of involving Earth is so forced that it's it's just really obvious. Uh, the action sequences were pretty weak. Uh, acting and script is lacking. Costumes and makeup and special effects are what I thought was the best part. Yes. And I had remembered that because I had watched it uh, again after being a kid. Um, and that was, that was my only takeaway. I couldn't tell you anything about else about it, but I remembered that I actually liked the, uh, makeup and special effects and the costumes. I thought they did a good job, even though that was one of the main complaints from all the actors is the costumes were too heavy. Um, but it, it, uh, even that, the visuals, it totally loses impact when they brought it into what was an apparently unpopulated town on earth. I don't know where everybody was, but (laughs) other than the music store, there was no one around ever. Um, all these action sequences of things exploding, people shooting, and there was nobody running in panic because there was just nobody there. It was a ghost town. It was strange. Um, the watch along, it made this bearable uh, and a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll never watch it again. Um, and um, yeah, one and a half stars might be a little generous, and I think you're right. Probably a little bit of nostalgia there just because I, I did enjoy it more when I was younger. You know, something I just just remembered as we were talking about this is when I did the second watch a couple nights ago, I was paying more attention to some of the uh, opening credits, and I noticed the name William Stout. Did you have this mm-hmm. in your notes at all? Mm-mm. No. So William Stout, I've been a longtime Mondo poster collector. I love the art uh, of these amazing artists that do uh, things for Mondo. They don't work directly for the company, but they design, and then the posters are printed and sold through Mondo. And I noticed his name on the beginning. Apparently, he was the art director on the film. His his uh, posters for Mondo are some of my favorites. He's a really, really talented guy. And I forgot I had actually seen him at a panel at the very first Mondo Con when they were talking about some of the art. And he talked about doing art for this film and a few others. Oh, cool. Uh, they, they expected this film to be bigger Mm-hmm. and have a huge budget and do all these amazing things and they actually spent they did the right thing by bringing him in and i think that's why we got to see so many cool things in the costumes and the details of the special effects in or the makeup not the special effects but the makeup and stuff mm-hmm. uh but if you guys don't know william stout look him up uh just an amazing artist uh very creative and his name is attached to several movies uh, over the years i have up uh, here as well let's see 
Uh, those are books. Well, anyway, go look it up. Uh, oh, Return of the Living Dead. Uh, he had something to do with that. King Kong. Uh, long, long Live King Kong. And a few others that you might recognize. But the guy, is just visually, he gets it. Uh, and I thought that was interesting to see his name on there. I didn't know he was attached to that film or didn't remember until we had the rewatch. Yeah, that's cool. I wonder if maybe that's more the artwork for like the posters and and titles and stuff like that, because I remember that being pretty good. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know what the exact term for particular positions are. We, we should look that up, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, not huge fans of the original. Um, <laughs> so it kind of, for me, felt like a blank slate. Like when we write our pitches for our other movies, it's usually I'm resistant to a reboot. You know, I, I like the idea of a sequel. But this one, I, I don't feel like I'm stepping on any toes or anything. Like we could just start from scratch and uh, I'm okay with that. And this one, I think, deserves it, too. I mean, obviously, we're there are enough fans out there. Look at all the series that have come out and the ones that are coming out. Um, this is a this is the kind of thing that, if done properly, everybody's looking for the next Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, these worlds of fantasy mm -hmm. that you can expand on. And if this is done well, then you could have uh, an entire series of movies done here. Yeah. This, is, this is an unexplored territory. Well, not unexplored. Uh, 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 poorly mapped out uh, in the cinema world. Um, so people have been there. They just didn't write down where the heck they went and what pitfalls to avoid. Um, so, so now they can do it proper. All these other companies are trying to create a universe. Like you said, Harry Potter, Marvel, DC. They even use the term, the, the DCEU. That's a DC mm -hmm. Entertainment Universe. The MCU, the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This has already got it in the title. Masters yep. of the Universe. It's already there. <laughs> like, you don't even have to go that far. It's already set up. It's ready to go. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so we'll do our own pitches. I don't remember who did the was first last time. I don't around, either. So you want to roll the dice? <laughs> I, I'll go first uh, if you want. Right. Uh, I do yeah. want to take a second to call this part out again, and I, I try to do this with each of the podcasts. Guys, there are a ton of movie podcasts out there, but what we do is so very different from this point on. We've already we've reviewed the movie. We've talked about it. But now we're about to give our own original takes, our own ideas on if they should do a reboot, a sequel, a prequel, a spinoff, whatever. This means – that we each sat down independently, we did not talk about this in advance, and write out what we want to see. We pick the directors, we pick the cast, we give the synopsis. All this is our own original content from here on out. And I think this is what sets us apart from all other podcasts. I love this part. I mm -hmm. stress over it. Yeah. I stress watching the movie. I stress <laughs> writing it. I'm always like, oh, he's going to blow me out of the water with this one. It's going to be so good. I'm going to fail miserably. And then I get into this groove where it starts to come together. And you're nodding your head, uh, which you must go through the same thing. And I'm like, oh, shit, I got it. This is this is it. I, this is the movie I want to see. And yeah. I did it again this week. Uh, I was laughing awesome. out loud to myself while writing and casting, having so much fun with it. And, and now I've premised that hopefully you enjoy my pitch as well. I'm going to go first, uh, which is dangerous because, uh, I, and, oh, by the way, no drones uh, in this one. So uh, hopefully we're okay. That's a shout out to a previous episode. I hope you enjoy He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. That is my title because Masters of the Universe is great, but we all know He-Man. We've referred to it as Motu, but most people just call it He-Man. We got to get back in the title. For director, I love to dream. I think he's got the visuals. I love all of his movies, even if they're not fun, or even if they're not great uh, story-wise. The special effects and the makeup are always great. Guillermo de Toro needs to direct a Masters of the Universe film. Stars. I spent a lot of time on this because it is going to be a complete reboot. My brother's right. If you'd have said you were going to make a sequel, I would have had you checked, had your temperature checked because God, no. Uh, Sam Hugan from Outlander, the lead in Outlander. I want him as my He-Man. I think if he buffed up a little bit more, he'd be a great He-Man. He's 6'3". I think he looks the part. I didn't know he was that tall until I looked him up. Travis Fimmel, who you'll know from Vikings and Raised by Wolves. I want him as my Skeletor. Dude's got a trippy kind of look to him anyway he normally has this big grungy beard but i think him in the skeletor makeup he'd be able to play this really well he's also a taller guy you know to be they both need to be tall and buff this world is is they're jacked you know helen mirren as the sorceress 
I think she'd be perfect. I doubt we're getting all these people in a movie, but I love the idea. Jack McBrayer as the voice of Orko. We got to have a little comedy for it. You may know Jack McBrayer from uh, 30 Rock, the doofus uh, guy on there, the comedy relief, the southern accent guy. Uh, he also did the voice of uh, Fix It Felix in wreck I love that guy. He's oh, me so too. funny. I heard him in a commercial the other day, and I, and I was like, oh, what's Jack up to these mm -hmm. days? I think mm -hmm. he'd make a great Orko. Mm -hmm. uh, Kurt Russell as Man at Arms. Because you got to have somebody who can grow a killer mustache. Not a fake one, a real mustache. And Kurt Russell has some of the most epic uh, facial hair in all of Hollywood. <laughs> uh, because I like to put her in every movie, because I want to see more of her every day. Alexandra Daddario from San Andreas and Baywatch as Tila. Because she'd look great in Tila, whatever Tila wears. Uh, and because it's Guillermo de Toro, you know this guy's name had to come up. we got to have Ron Perlman as King Randor. And Connie Nielsen from Wonder Woman and Gladiator as Queen Marlena. Setting for this film is current day Eternia. So whatever the hell that means. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you make your own determination. We're actually going to spend some time on Eternia for this film, unlike mm -hmm. the 87 production. Here we go. Here's my pitch. The movie begins with a glimpse into the daily life of a teenage boy on the planet Eternia. Prince Adam, son of King Randor and Queen Marlena, is at the table with his mother and sister in a homeschool meets, med meets medieval times, not the family dinner theater chain, set up. Sitting near the table is Cringer, He-Man's giant cat and favorite companion. Queen Marlena announces that they are done learning for the day and may be excused. Prince Adam and Cringer leave the castle and begin a journey across the vast courtyards of Castle Grayskull, their home, to meet with the sorceress. He had long been more interested in the magical teaching she made available and was always eager to learn a few new tricks. Orko, a longtime friend from the extra-dimensional world of Trolla, who had found himself stranded on Eternia during a cosmic storm, is already there trying out and totally botching any spell he had come up with. While chatting with the sorceress, Man-at-Arms bursts through the door and announces that the castle is under attack. We're getting right into it. Prince Adam is shocked at the news. In his life, he had been in many skirmishes with people outside the castle, but never had anyone dared to attack Grayskull. He dashes to the armory and grabs a sword and shield and heads to the castle wall. A large army is seen just outside the gates. At the front of the group, we see a floating barge-like carriage with a throne atop. And in that throne, a hideous creature made of muscle and bones, wearing armor and carrying a huge staff with a skull of some sort attached to the top. Prince Adam watched as the royal army opened the front gates of Grayskull and marched out to meet this mystery skeleton man and his army. The royal army was known for its superior skill and had a history of laying waste to any foe who dare cross King Randor and Queen Marlena, so there is no need to worry about the outcome. Prince Adam actually found it amusing that the skeleton man would even get close to the castle and was already picturing the hundred different ways he'd be killed when he saw the unthinkable. A light shot from the staff of the mystery character, and dozens of the royal army were blown back through the castle gates. Several of them killed instantly, and the rest horribly wounded. Prince Adam turned to rush down to the gate, but only got a few steps before he saw the sorceress standing a few feet away. In a tone and seriousness that Prince Adam had never heard before, she shouted a few words of a spell, and they were transported to her chambers, along with Cringer, who of course had not left uh, Adam's side. Quick, we have no time to discuss this. There's a great secret that your parents and I have kept from you your entire life. I've prepared for this day since before your birth and must act quickly. She raised her arms high and began to chant, moving her arms around in a very specific pattern, uttering words Prince Adam had never heard before. She moved faster and faster, got louder and louder for the next minute or two, and then bam, a huge sword appeared before her, floating in the air. She looked at Prince Adam and said, take it and poof, she was gone. Just as she vanished, he was reaching out to grasp the mighty sword, and with her disappearance, it fell uh, toward the ground, but not before he could catch its weight and hold it in front of him. There was silence. The sorceress was gone. But where? He stood there for a minute and then turned to head back to the main gates. As he reached for the door, Orko appeared. The sorceress has been taken. Orko didn't finish what he was going to say. He looked down at the sword that Adam was carrying and said, Thank the gods she got to you in time. Come with me. Orko, Adam, and Cringer returned to the castle walls to see the skeleton man and his army ride off into the distance, with the sorceress held captive aboard his floating barge. Prince Adam moved as if to leap towards the lower level, and Orko stopped him. You can't, Prince Adam. She's gone. You can't go after her like this. 
It took all his might to hold Prince Adam back. You aren't powerful enough, said Orko. Orko then guided Adam and Cringer to the main throne room. King Randor and Queen Marlena both reacted to the prince's presence in the same way Orko did, with a thank the gods response. Then they began to tell Prince Adam of a plan many years in the making. The sword held magical abilities and could only be activated by the Chosen One, in this case, Adam. To access these powers, he need only raise the sword and utter a few words. Mm-hmm. But what? By the power of If you don't have that moment in the movie, you <laughs> failed. That's a, that's a whisper down to the 1987 film. How do we not have that moment? It's mm. so iconic. It's one of the most iconic things in, in history of pop culture. Uh, you got to have it. Prince Adam transformed into He-Man for the first time, and at his side, Cringer became a fierce battle cat, complete with saddle and armor, because all cats have saddles. Then the montage of Mom, Dad, and Orko explaining the plan, complete with custom song, not recorded by Sting, please. And He-Man <laughs> testing his new sword and power on inanimate objects of all sizes. He did have the power now. Fast forward to He-Man approaching Snake Mountain on Battle Cat. With Orko, Man-at-Arms, Tila, and a variety of action figures turned live action heroes at their side. They storm the castle, enter Skeletor's throne room. Yeah, we learned his name from some villagers at this point. And an epic battle ensues. He-Man eventually overcomes Skeletor, but doesn't kill him? Question marks. They free the sorceress and return to Grayskull. There's a giant feast, and then all seems right in the land. But of course, there is the impending threat of Skeletor, should he, well, when he, raises another army and tries to attack again. At the end of the film, we see Skeletor limping from the throne room, out a secret door behind the throne, and down a long corridor. He eventually enters another very different-looking door and pulls himself into a chamber that quickly fills with smoke and lights. As the chamber closes, the camera pulls back to reveal that he is actually inside a spaceship. And on the outside of that ship, some familiar logos. Here's the big reveal that we get. We see King Randor and Queen Marlena back in their room at Castle Grayskull. Queen Marlena pulls a photo from a chest at the foot of her bed, and she holds it up to King Randor as she speaks. Did you see it? His staff. It looked just like his tattoo. King Randor responded, yeah, only Keldor could have known about that skull with the horns. Nothing like that exists on this planet. It couldn't be a coincidence. On this planet? Keldor? Tattoo? We then see the photo up close and quickly piece it together. The royal couple are actually Randy and Marlene, members of a lost Mars expedition led by Elon Musk's SpaceX. Their <laughs> ship had veered off course and was thought lost but it turns out the ship was pulled into a black hole just outside the Milky Way and thrust across the universe where it crash landed on a planet they eventually named Eternia. They thought the rest of the crew had died as well, but in the photo we see another man with a tattoo. The name on his uniform reads Keldor. Roll the credits. That's good. Thank you. I, uh, yeah, I that was fun. Piece together... I read a bunch about, I, I watched He-Man mm -hmm. as a kid. I watched the film. But I read a bunch about the other versions of He-Man. Uh, yeah. And in some, uh, uh, Skeletor was referred to as Keldor. And in some, it turns out that they were humans that were misplaced on another planet. And I thought, instead of taking the battle to Earth, let's bring the Earth to Eternia and have that connection so that when we have future films, if we want to, now we can venture over to the Earth realm. You know, I thought that would be a lot of fun. They, they've somehow made it to this planet that has magic as a thing. Right. we got to have fun with that. we got to have the moment of him converting. I, I made fun of it, but y if you don't have that, you don't have He-Man. I, I still can't believe they never worked that into the original film. It's ridiculous. He was never Prince Adam in the film. Yeah, they just did away with Prince Adam. Yeah. There was no alter ego. He just always was He-Man. Which in some of the takes on the comics and, and TV shows, the cartoons, apparently there were times he was never Prince Adam. That right, actually yeah. came later. Uh, but I thought it was, to me, the original cartoon series with two seasons and like 130 episodes. How'd they do that in two seasons? Uh, mm -hmm. it was was That's where it's at. So we got to have elements of that. Yeah, I hope you all found it fun. I, I enjoyed writing it. That was a, That was a good time. Yeah, it was good. Plus, I I think everybody has learned that lesson in um, creating animated shows where you just 
that transformation sequence that's like five minutes of your show that you can just reuse every episode you yep. don't have to do new animations uh so it's a great uh, way to fill in some time uh so yeah you want that in your in your show plus also, everybody likes a transformation also a key thing when i was making my notes to start this i said my favorite movies are the mcu origin story films that's what i was gonna say right yeah this is an yeah. origin story you gotta start with it it's a it's a guaranteed box office smash you're right every origin story is loved and we were denied that in the Dolph Lundgren version. Yeah. There was there was no origin story. We just jumped right in. Which it worked they for Star were, Wars, but they were still yeah. a bit trailblazing, I guess, because now we know that with all the other movies and stuff, but they they were hoping to just jump off of the um pre existing knowledge and fandom of He Man going in. So they didn't feel like they probably wanted to do an origin story. But I agree, that's where it's at. So mine's an origin story as well. Um, I wanted to, this is probably, I, I read as much of the canon as I could, and I think I'm probably altering things a little bit here. So this is a slight reimagining, but I, I think considering there is some contradictory stuff in all the existing ones that it really doesn't matter too much. Um, so I'm sure someone will be offended, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I want to take um, a, a little bit of a different look at this. Mine is still going to be dramatic. There's still going to be some action sequences, but I actually want to treat this a little bit more of a comedy. Uh, I think we see that there's humor in these terrible names, He-Man and she -Ra. I have selected your finest warriors. Blade. Sarad. The Beast Man and Karg. They're just so lazy and lame that I kind of want to play with that. The costumes are a bit dorky, like it's it's all just a bit campy and goofy. So I I want to play with that as much as we can. Um, the pitch that I wrote wrote here is still more drama and stuff i think most of the comedy is going to come through in dialogue so i didn't i didn't write any of that uh, but i think you'll pick up on what i'm going for here when you hear my casting for my version of masters of the universe guess who's playing prince adam jesse plemons oh my god <laughs> i already can't wait to see this i know um and we've also got cara delavine as princess adora uh this is something i'm doing too is that I don't really use their uh, transformative names. I'm going with, since this is the origin story, we're doing mostly just their uh, normal names or whatever. So Jesse Plemons is Prince Adam. Cara Delevingne is Princess Adora. Michelle Pfeiffer is Queen Marlena. Ooh, yeah. Gerard Butler, since we were just talking about him in Greenland, is King Randor. Mads Mikkelsen is Keldor, who That's later becomes boring. Skeletor. Uh, and then I found this guy, Milland Soman, as uh, he'll play Duncan. Um, and J.B. Smoove uh, voicing Orko. That guy is just a comic character the way he talks <laughs> anyway. So I, I think he's going to be great. And we're riding the Bullock train this season. Sandra Bullock <laughs> as, is cast as rival basket maker. <laughs> um, I think I've used this guy before in uh, one of my other pitches, but I can't remember which. Uh, Matthew Vaughn, uh, who directed Kick-Ass and X-Men First Class and Kingsman. Um, so I, I think he'll do good with the action, uh, but there's some comedy in those as well. So I think you might be able to handle that too. All right, here we go. Since the return of twin sister Adora, hero of the rebellion and conqueror over the evil horde, Prince Adam has been hiding out far away from Castle Grayskull and his royal family. Disguised as Fred Normal, this is sort of a comment on the terrible naming, <laughs> uh, a local Eternian merchant, Adam has strived to become a master basket weaver, though his rival in the neighboring stall of the Weekend Bazaar continually outdesigns and outsells the prince. That's Sandra Bullock. Along with Cat Cringer and friend retired soldier Duncan, Adam spends his days practicing new weaving techniques in his nights drinking, often stumbling to the local King Grayskull statue to question how he could descend from such greatness and yet be so worthless. Then rumors spread that Adam's father, King Randor, is taken ill, and Uncle Keldor, a menacing blue-skinned character with a shady past, is next in line for the throne. 
Summoned by Orko, Castle Grayskull's dim-witted magical court jester, Adam returns to the royal castle to visit his dying father. Princess Adora is angered over Adam's absence and the knowledge that their mother, Queen Marlena, has unashamedly involved herself with her uncle Keldor under their father and king's very nose. The king is stricken silent, unable to speak with his family, but Adam senses their collective embarrassment of the cowardly royal son. Adora confesses she doesn't trust the potential new king, but there's nothing they can do to stand in his way. That evening, King Randor dies and his brother Keldor takes the throne, Marlena now his queen. Months pass, and Eternia is in a lowly state. They've been thrust into war across the universe, dispersing the population, driving others to poverty. It is clear that Keldor is a tyrant, and he's called in a personal army of miscreants to protect him and his interests. Keldor rules with an iron fist, and his people are suffering. Basket sales are down, though Adam's rival somehow continues to profit. Adam's friend Duncan, now too old to fight in the Eternia military, wants to initiate a rebellion and overthrow their new king, seating Adam in his place. Adam, more concerned over his basket business, is afraid to fight, but he's mostly afraid to be the ruler of Eternia, living in the shadow of his father and ancestor, the great King Grayskull. With his sister away in battle, Adam becomes the reluctant leader of the rebels. He trains with Duncan in swordplay and hand-to-hand combat, but he's fat and clumsy, a terrible warrior. Duncan, however, is a great strategist, and they manage to coordinate attacks that cripple Keldor's army and aid the people of Eternia. Orko even manages to pull off a spell or two, but the rebellion is short-lived. Adam and his friends are captured and imprisoned in Castle Grayskull. Prince Adam is visited by his mother while in jail. She wants him to know that she's sorry for what has happened and that his father was proud of him. Her behavior is strange, as if she's struggling to, s- to say what she wants to say. Unbeknownst to the guards, she secretly passes him a book. Adam discovers it was his father's diary and that King Randor was exhausted by wars of the past and encouraged his son to choose a different path. He wanted him to follow his own dreams, hoping he could s- save him from the misery of conflict and eternal threat to the kingdom. As Adam reads more and more, he finds evidence that his father believed Uncle Keldor was using magic to weaken him and Queen Marlena. Adam now suspects that Keldor killed his brother and entranced the queen. Earlier passages from the diary reference a sword of power embodied by the soul of King Grayskull, one destined to be wielded by the true king of Eternia, one who can bring peace to the universe, perhaps master it. With Orko's help, He and Duncan escape to find a hidden chamber containing the magic sword. Adam struggles to lift it, hoping it will transform him into a great warrior, but nothing happens. Duncan points out an inscription on the hilt. Adam casually reads the word, by the power of Grayskull, and becomes a super muscular, his hair and outfit changing to suit his new barbarian bulk. So it's like a really downplayed version of it. Uh, Adam tells Orko to find Adora and tell her of Keldor's treachery. A sequence of fights begins as Adam and Duncan tear through the evil army. When they reach Keldor, they're overwhelmed by his magic. Adam loses the sword, and when Keldor takes it and speaks the magic phrase, his skin is torn from his body, leaving nothing but a skeleton. Despite his disfigurement, he's more powerful than ever before and intends to kill Adam when Adora appears with Orko. She overtakes the tyrant king, and Adam recovers his sword. Together, brother and sister defeat Keldor, freeing their mother of his enchantment and bringing peace to Eternia. I like it. Yeah, should I be like fun. Take. Yeah, I don't know if uh, he'll go from like if he'll still be tubby or not, <laughs> or, if, <laughs> or if he'll just change. It. Either way, it could be funny. He'll look like uh, Bro Thor. <laughs> right. Exactly. I, that's so funny. You went with the Keldor bit too. Uh, the yeah. same name. I like your take on it, though. That's that's really good. I, I can see that. So we spend a lot more time, like you said, with the prince and princess and the king mm-hmm. and this Keldor fellow before he becomes Skeletor and he becomes He-Man, setting up future. Right. Yeah. I because, like yeah, even the bad guy needs the origin story, too. I basically stole my plot from Hamlet, so uh, a little bit of a cheat there. How many films a good do? story. You're, you're, fine. <laughs> you're okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that was a lot of fun, and uh, I like both of those. Uh, either one will be better than the original, so uh, I think we're golden. Um, let's see. But we do have some retakes coming up. We've got two, count them, two animated series coming to Netflix. First is called Masters of the Universe Revelation. This is a direct sequel to He-Man and the Masters of the Universe animated series that follows Tila searching for the missing power sword. Okay, fine. Good for me. Uh, We've recently heard uh, the casting lineup. Mark Hamill will voice Skeletor. Chris Wood will voice Prince Adam and He-Man. Other voices are Stephen Root, Lena Headey, Sarah Michelle Gellar, and Diedrich Bader. And there's a lot of other good ones in there too, but these are 
just so many. the few I mentioned. That should come out in spring of 2021, uh, probably around the time when the movie comes out, but we really don't know. Uh, making these predictions now is kind of silly. Well, it's a couple notes on that. It's it's well underway to the point Kevin Smith is helming this thing, right? Which is mm -hmm. huge. Uh, he has already got to the point where they're working on the music for it, and he just brought in, I can't remember the guy's name, uh, famous uh, music for different movies and, and TV shows and stuff. Uh, but Kevin Smith's been sharing updates on his social media channels all along the way. So if you want to kind of keep up to date with what's going on and you don't already follow Kevin Smith, I highly recommend it. But the other day he did a, a live uh, or he recorded a video of him hearing the music for the first time and like reacting mm. to it. You know how animated Kevin Smith is. Uh, and he just... He's just pumped, man. You could tell how excited he is because he's a longtime fan. And what Kevin Smith has that nobody else has uh, when it comes to this is he's truly a fan, and he has this amazing memory for all the details. If mm -hmm. anybody's going to do it right, I feel like he's going to do it right. And I can't wait. I'm not even normally excited about anything animated. I am stoked for this. I can't wait to see what he does with it. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot of fun. I haven't watched any of the she but I should probably check that out, um, see if it's good. Um there's also going to be a CGI uh, one that's supposed to be a bit more adult, uh, but we don't know much else about it, um, casting or release date or anything. Probably will take a little bit longer being CGI, but who knows what they have available now. Probably just somebody speaks into a microphone and it creates it. Uh, there's wonderful <laughs> machines for that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> but we do have a, a motion picture that should also come out. Uh, the synopsis for guess what it's called? masters of the universe never so thought of that he man the most powerful man in the universe goes against the evil skeletor to save the planet eternia and protect the secrets of castle grayskull okay nothing new there noah centineo as prince adam slash he man uh and that's all we have for casting yeah supposedly this is going to be directed by uh, aaron knee along with his brother adam sometimes referred to as the brother's knee directed several <laughs> yeah the people that say me <laughs> yeah that's great we need <laughs> we need a shrubbery <laughs> another shrubbery with a nice tea effect um directed several shorts two feature length films uh one is the last romantic in 2006 and band of robbers in 2015 i've heard of neither Same. um so who knows uh writers early screenplay was david s goyer you'll remember from our blade episode uh as well as christopher yost who's written for a lot of animated superhero shows mm -hmm. but he also wrote max steel and helped with thor ragnarok um then we also have some update uh updated writing from matt holloway and art markham and i failed to go grab their stuff um so if you want to look at that fine but uh i've not heard of them either uh release date for this is uh march 4th 2021 it's in pre-production uh which is not very much <laughs> to say so yeah. we don't know that's interesting is it's uh if they did bring david s goyer on the guy his laundry list his, his resume is insane he's a fantastic writer uh but who was the director of the original film the guy's last name was goyer right no it was um i thought it was it's goddard Oh, Gary Goddard. Goddard. Okay, that's right. There's another uh, fantastic writer, Drew S. Goddard, uh, yes, for a lot okay. of the superhero shows. I wonder if there's any relation. I got off track there. Um, yeah, this movie, like you said, I, I I did some research on this. I think it was a Wikipedia page that shows the number of tries over the last two decades to get this off the ground. The number yeah. of writers, producers, directors, actors that have been tied to it is insane. It needs its own flow chart uh, before we get to this point, which maybe far from the last iteration and i'm sure that some of that just ends up being rumor but i bet there's so many projects that are like that that just keep getting passed around everybody tries and maybe even makes a little progress and then just whatever happens and things get pushed yeah. to the back burner or just completely neglected and then have to wait until somebody else picks it up um but you know uh eventually we get well even if we get one it doesn't really matter now they just will reboot it do it again so yeah. uh it doesn't matter if a movie sucks just wait a couple years and there'll be another one yeah uh so i am excited though uh i, I know it's really early to know 
anything about that. But again, this is a movie that is is wide open for a new take on it. So anything is welcome, really. Um, and uh, hopefully the series are are cool too. But before we move on, I I, I meant to shimmy this in before i did mention there's a couple things kind of as homework that everyone should watch if you're a fan of he-man and you haven't already one is a, a movie length uh behind the scenes documentary called the power of grayskull it's on netflix here in the states and one of the uh producers on it is uh, adam f goldberg creator of mm. the goldbergs this dude knows his 80s pop culture uh, really interesting what they pulled together there. There's a lot of overlap with the other thing I would recommend, which is the toys that made us from season one about He-Man and Masters of the Universe. And they talk about the action figures and how the t the cartoon was really simply a advertisement for the action figures. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But it changed everything. Like it changed action figures having their own origins, not just being based off a show. Um, and, and I love both of them, even though there's some overlap, I highly recommend if you consider yourself a Masters of the Universe fan, go watch both. I think you'll really enjoy both. I, I just rewatched um, uh, By the Power of Grayskull yesterday while I was doing my notes for inspiration. Uh, it's really, really well done. That's cool. Adam should write the comedy version of uh, he, Masters of the Universe. That'd be great. To, honestly, he is on like my top five list of people I want to do a podcast with because I hmm. really am intrigued by this guy, and I think we got great things to to uh, get from him in the upcoming years. Yeah. Okay, well, let's do some uh, trivia on this one and a half star non blockbuster Masters of the Universe. <laughs> what went wrong? Let's list all the ways that things went wrong on this movie. <laughs> I'll kick it off. I, I love I love the trivia, and I don't read it each week until we get to this point because I like being uh, awed as well. Uh, first up, Frank Langella said playing Skeletor was one of his favorite roles. His son was a huge fan, always running around the house shouting by the power of Grayskull. So Langella took the role for him. He wrote some of his own lines like, Tell me about the loneliness of good. He man is it equal to the loneliness of evil brilliant line langella uh many viewers of the film commented on actresses actress meg foster's eerily effective contact lenses which gave her character evil lynn a sinister and unearthly air actually she wore no contact lenses her eyes naturally have blue gray irises and tiny pupils giving her a striking appearance she's often been cast in sci-fi fantasy roles because of them and jokes that she appeals to casting directors as she brings her own special effects with her for free and i was mistaken i had said in the watch along i thought she was on v because i just thought that i remembered seeing her face it wasn't her she wasn't on v so she kind of looks like her though i know who you're talking she, about she should have been yeah uh, Mattel, the toy company that produced the original He-Man story, ran a contest where the winner would get a role in the new He-Man movie. The production was under a great deal of pressure to finish in time and under budget, so director Gary Goddard had to squeeze the contest winner into the shoot. The winner, Richard Sponder, is Pig Boy, who hands Skeletor his staff when he returns from Earth. He was even listed in the ending credits. And that answers one of your <laughs> questions we... we queued up at the beginning i did not notice pig boy i did remember i was commenting on uh i made fun of it i was like oh there's a guy that just hands him his staff every time <laughs> and i was like well, that, that's nice job security all you have to do is just hold the staff and when he comes you just hand the staff over oh. uh uh, the throne room set of Castle Grayskull was originally two large adjoining sound stages. The wall between the sets was knocked down to make one gigantic sound stage. At the time, this was the largest set Hollywood had seen in over 40 years. God, crazy, man. A script for a sequel to be titled Masters of the Universe 2 Cyborg was written. It followed He-Man who returned to Earth to battle Skeletor. Earth again? Who had left Earth a post-apocalyptic a post-apocalyptic wasteland. The film was to feature Trapjaw and She-Ra. Yeah! And Albert Pune, Pyun was hired to direct. Because the film bombed at the box office, Mattel and Cannon decided to cancel production on the sequel. Pyun rewrote the script, which became Cyborg in 1989. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. That's great. <laughs> I did not yes, know that. Was that. A, that was that Van Damme movie. Yes! With yeah. Dolph Lundgren. Was he in that? Yes. I thought he was, Yeah. 
Oh yeah, it you're was right. London no. and, and Van Dam. Wait, was that the same one I'm thinking where they were in like Nam and then like was Lundgren or something collected the ears or something? Was something that the like same that. movie? Yeah, yep. yeah, okay. And it was All featured right, cool. in uh, The Postman with Kevin Costner. They would watch it in that canyon because it was the only movie they had left. <laughs> oh wow. Okay. <laughs> Sad times. That is the apocalypse. <laughs> Mattel, which owned and produced the Masters of the Universe toy line, mandated early in production that He-Man could not kill anyone on screen, and that's why Skeletor's troops are robots. Oh, that's a nice workaround. That's pretty smart. Robots have feelings, too. Well, there you go. If they're programmed to. Due to the 50-plus pound weight of his blade suit, Anthony DeLongas said in an interview with the Motu Movie website that when he would remove his boots, he would regularly pour out his sweat from them in the end of every day he was filming the movie. Oh, they that, couldn't put some sweat holes in the boots? <laughs> that is disgusting. Gross. Uh, at the time of filming, Dolph Lundgren had limited acting experience. No, really? Spoke with a thick Swedish accent <laughs> and was not yet fluent in English. It's all right. It's all right. Don't be afraid, I won't hurt you. Now, what are you running from? I'm running from these, these, these monsters. Easy, easy. These creatures are supposed to take care of it. Director Gary Goddard had planned to have all of Lundgren's lines dubbed by another actor. However, Lundgren's contract stipulated that he would have at least three opportunities to redub his lines in post production. With the film running behind schedule, Goddard decided to use Lundgren's natural voice instead. It wasn't that bad. Honestly. No, it wasn't. But it, he had three different shots at making it sound a little better. So good, good negotiations there, Lundgren. I guess. Beastman's prosthetic teeth were so large that performer Tony Carroll was a unable to close his mouth when in costume. After a while, he would begin to drool, filling his chin piece with saliva. <laughs> saliva and sweat abound. Yeah, just a gross and slippery <laughs> set. Ugh, this, it was the world's <laughs> largest gross and slippery set. A total of three working cosmic key props were built for the film, each personally constructed by Richard Edlund. The props were extremely fragile and broke down easily, so a special team of prop technicians had to be on hand at all times to repair damage during filming. As of 2012, they're valued at $6,000 each. Dude, I would buy one of those for $6,000 right now. That's going to be worth a fortune one day. It, I guarantee it would go for more at auction right now. It's just going to show up and just a bunch of parts loose in a box. Yeah, you've got to piece it together. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Lego. Lego should make a set. Yeah, they should make a Cosmic Key Lego set. Oh, my God. Because of financial difficulties, Canon Cinema made a decision to discontinue all filming three days before its scheduled end. Three days? Good luck. Yeah. Leaving the movie in a quandary. All the cinematic scenes were completed except for the final battle between He-Man and Skeletor. After two months, the Canon Cinema executives allowed director Gary Goddard to film the ending in a complete, albeit rushed, manner. What just a horrible, horrible decision process. They're going to spend the money anyway and had to bring everybody back. Finish the film. They, I, don't think, I don't think they wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> they reluctantly finished the movie. For the miniature shot set on Earth, the special effects men at Boss Film Studios reused some buildings left over from both Blade Runner 1982 and Ghostbusters in 1984 oh. to fill out the background. That's cool. I would like to go back and match those up. I'm sure someone has. According to Gary Goddard, the draft of the script he received took place completely on Earth in order to keep the budget down. Although he liked the fish out of water aspect, he asked for more money so he could film, so he could at least start and end the film on the planet Eternia. Thank you, Gary Goddard. You're the real hero here. <laughs> uh, and you called this during the watch along. The same sound effect that was used for the entrance of the DeLorean time machine, Back to the Future, is also used when Gwildor comes crashing through the junkyard fence to help He-Man, Julie, Duncan, and Tila escape in the native transportation. <laughs> I did. I remember hearing that because that's so iconic. Come on, now these days? Um, and I actually thought about when writing my pitch, if, if I did take an Earth perspective, I was going to work the car in as a key element to tie mm. the two films together like somebody found it and that led to all this but i didn't want to tie the two films together so <laughs> yeah no don't have any association other than the characters yeah. god yeah. let's let's just all forget 
I, I think the only thing I'd like to see if they really do this, and they'll have to, because that's kind of the standard now, is like Dolph Lundgren in some role in the new film. It can't be the right. king. It can't be a major role like that, but just a quick some point on scene, just a little nod to the original. He can be the new pig boy. Oh my God. <laughs> that's a big pig boy. <laughs> And he looks a little more like bacon these days. Oh, yeah. Oh, my. All right. Well, um, it's so good to be back. And uh, we appreciate you coming back. Um, and uh, lots of good episodes planned for this season. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, there's going to be watch longs, and lots of live episodes. So follow us on Twitter um, where we will update you with the uh, next lives and all that so you can come join us and uh, interact with us it is a ton of fun especially uh with the trivia uh which we do on all the lives you get to play along uh compete with the other folks on the movie trivia um yeah it, it's it's a good good fun well uh as they say on attorney uh, good journey everyone and uh support a writer read a book by the power of grace gold nerds unite